Hello. Hi. Um, I have to apologize for not speaking Spanish. Um, I'm see so glad to see all of you here, and uh, welcome to my little talk. Hopefully it won't go on too long. Um, so, my name is Ola, and I just moved here to Ecuador less than two weeks ago, so hopefully next time I give a speech, maybe I'll do it in Spanish, but for now, you'll have to do with the translation. So, um, I am a coder. I write code, and that's what I'm really good at. So, when I stand here speaking, uh, that's me doing something that I am not the best at, but uh, I hope you'll at least get some enjoyment out of my thoughts. So I wanted to talk about this idea. Um, this idea of Ecuador as a place where, um, well, you'll find out what the idea is about. Right now, the world is in a strange place. The summer has had a lot of revelations, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, um, but Snowden, uh, has revealed a lot of spying that's been happening on the world. But these things are not new. This is just what we are finding out that it's happening. But it's been happening for, at this point, hundreds of years. Um, the only thing that's new is that we're getting more and more powerful technology. Technology is the thing that is changing everything for us. And, and technology is giving us exponential, in, uh, exponential increase in the capabilities of what these intelligence agencies can do uh, to get information um, about everything that we're doing from day to day. We are very close to having all the technology we need for any moderately uh, rich country to, to know everything that's happening in the world. We're very close to that point. Now, for me, I find that this state of the world is very, very scary. I am not a huge fan of where we're going. I am not comfortable with the United States talking about cyber war. I'm not comfortable with the United States and many other countries doing pervasive surveillance of everything they can in the world. I'm not comfortable with the United Kingdom wanting to know everything, total internet uh, information awareness and all these things. At the same time, around the world, if you look at all the countries in the world, you will see that most countries in the world are very rapidly adopting new legislation. They're writing new law. They're doing new trade agreements. And you might think that based on what's happening this summer, that all of these new laws and all of these new trade agreements are really about stopping the surveillance, that it's about curtailing the powers of intelligence services. But no. Instead, what's happening is an acceleration now, I come from Sweden, and Sweden is an interesting place. Um, we have a lot of surveillance. The biggest difference with the surveillance in Sweden is that we have legislation that makes it legal. Uh, it's something called the FRA law, and this law was passed a few years ago, and all of the things that are happening in the US that all the Americans are very upset about, all the things that are happening in the rest of the world, well, we were just a little bit earlier in Sweden in getting the legislation passed to make it legal. But make no mistake, this direction, every country or almost every country in the world is going in the direction towards making these practices legal and easier and better for the intelligence services. So really, the place I'm coming from is I'm looking around the world and I'm seeing a very dystopian future. I'm seeing the heading we're on as being very, very dangerous for everyone in the world. Now, I want to talk a little bit first about how the physical world impacts the internet, because it ties into this. And I, I think that one of the main problems we're seeing is actually the physical world and the internet um, are tied together in places where we don't really expect it. And the way we have been passing laws, the way we have been um, working in the real world the last hundreds and hundreds of years, we're trying to use the same approach when it comes to the internet, and we're trying to pass legislation over the internet as if the internet is a place, as if there's internet is just some other place that exists just like you can go to you can go to Brazil, you can go to the internet, and when you go to the internet the laws are different, or even worse, 
The laws are different depending on where you are or where the server is that you are talking to, or the laws are different whether your traffic happens to pass through a law uh, or a place where they have laws that make things different. And all of this has to do with the, the fact that actually the physical world is very different from the digital world, from, from the information world. And trying to conflate those two is causing a lot of problems. So there are a lot of different ways that different laws impact the internet. And um, I think that the most important and easiest one to say is that the physical world right now, legislation is a big part of what governs what you can say and what you can do and what happens on the internet. Different places have different laws. In, in um, Say, for example, in Germany and in France. In Germany, it's illegal uh, to, um, to spread um, neo-Nazi speech. Uh, that includes on the internet. On the other hand, in the United States, you have the First Amendment that says that free speech is a fundamental right. And then you have France, where you have very similar laws uh, to Germany when it comes to Nazi memorabilia and selling things like that. Now, the problem becomes when, for example, a company like, a, a very common case was when uh, eBay, which is a company that is based in the United States, it tries to, uh, um, well, eBay is in the United States, so you have free speech uh, legislation where the company is based. eBay servers are spread around the world, so the actual servers can be anywhere. And then someone from France uh, tries to sell neo-Nazi memorabilia on eBay. Now, doing that in France is illegal, so the French government wanted to stop this from happening. So they went to eBay and they asked them to stop this from happening. eBay wasn't sure what to do. They wanted to not take it down. They didn't want to censor. So uh, they went to the courts in the United States uh, because in the United States they have free speech rights. Another very similar example has to do with the sending of, um, well, there are hundreds of these cases, really. And we don't actually know how to deal with these cases because every time they come up in a court, they're handled differently. And it really depends on who the judge is. It really depends on who is doing the uh, understanding of the legal case. And it has to do with which jurisdiction. So when you say that a law applies on the internet, that's a very vague and strange concept. We also have trade agreements and copyright and IP. And actually, it turns out that uh, in, um, well, so-called intellectual property has been a very, very successful way for a lot of governments, including the, the United States government, to impose other kinds of sanctions on uh, countries. Uh, one, one example of this is the legislation in the European Union called IPRED, which is a fairly strong legislation that tries to stop uh, piracy of uh, intellectual intellectual property from happening. Uh, now, IPRED seems to have come about by a lot of backdoor pressure from the United States, and specifically from a lot of corporations in the United States that wanted to make sure you couldn't download uh, movies, for example. But the reality is that the law that was passed happens to require you, all the service providers to save IP numbers of everyone for a set amount of time. And this means that the ISPs has a lot of information about pe people that they really shouldn't have. This information can be useful to stop piracy, but it can also be useful for a whole bunch of other stuff. So in many countries, we're also seeing this scope creep where legislation starts as being about copyright and IP, and then it becomes about law enforcement, and then it becomes about surveillance. Because once you start building in these measures, they tend to be corrupted and they tend to be used for more than they're uh, intended for, or originally intended for. Now, I mentioned companies as well and corporations. And actually, uh, right now, uh, and I, I know that my next speaker is going to be talking a lot more about this, but the fat mags, the Facebook and Apple and Twitter, Microsoft, Amazon, Google and Salesforce, these companies have a disproportionate power about in what happens on the internet. And this power is based not really on physical force, but it's more based on economic force. They have so many page views. They have such a monopoly of what happens on the internet that they are free to do really whatever they want. They can say and do whatever they want. And 
they can also censor in any way they want. How do you stop Google from censoring a web page from, from PageRank? Well, I mean, they could just claim that, yeah, this is what the search algorithm shows up. And it might even be true. Maybe the search algorithm is written in such a way that uncomfortable material doesn't show up high. Um, Google uh, uses the, the fact that they have an algorithm as a defense, and they've successfully defended in its way many, many ways. But big companies are free to roam wild on the internet. Uh, it's no accident, of course, that the big companies are based in the U.S. to a large degree, and that there is a high correlation between the United States power and the corporation's power on the internet. Now, finally, and this is the important part, public opinion matters. Uh, public opinion matters a lot on the internet, and uh, I'm not a huge believer that we can fix many of the current surveillance problems by by just passing laws that make them illegal. First, we need people to actually want them to be changed. But there's another component of this. As long as we go to Facebook, as long as we go to Google, as long as we go to Yahoo, and we give them all of our information, as long as we do that, then nothing we can do to secure all the other pieces of the internet is going to make any difference, because we're still giving all of our information to, uh, to corporations that will sell that information. Um, so public opinion needs to be swayed. Public opinion needs to change about these subjects, because otherwise we will not see the kind of changes that we need to, uh, need to see. Now, the physical internet looks a little bit like this. Well, this is one example of the physical internet. This is uh, the DNS root servers. And um, they're spread all over the world. Uh, there is a disproportionate uh, spread of them in the United States and in Europe, but they're getting more and more out around the world. Um, there are also cables between countries. If you control cables, that means that you can control the internet better. Uh, there are routers and internet exchanges, and these are the places where the person who controls them pretty much controls the internet. So actually, where these things are placed make a huge difference for, uh, for the control over the internet. And this is another way in which the physical world impacts the internet. Now, why have I spent this time talking about how the physical world impacts the internet? Well, I want to go in the other direction. All of these things, all of these levers that I've talked about, all the ways where we have, where we have the real world impacting the internet. Well, remember what I said in the beginning, how every, almost every country, I need to stop myself, almost every country in the world is trying to pass laws that are going in the wrong direction. All of the other pressures of the physical world on the internet is pushing the internet to become something that has nothing to do with privacy. It has nothing to do with uh, anonymity. It has nothing to do with security. Um, now, I want to propose that we need something like a privacy haven. And this is not a new idea. Um, so what is a privacy haven? Well, if you want to think about it really, really simply, it's the opposite of all the, all the pressures I just mentioned. But the name comes from the likeness with a tax haven. And it, it's quite, it's fundamentally a quite simple idea. The idea is that you need a place where your privacy is protected. You need a physical place where your privacy is protected so that those protections can extend to the internet. You need a place in the real world where anonymity is legal, where you can be anonymous on the internet without any uh, problems. You need a place where data can flow freely, where you don't have censorship uh, of any kind. Really, you need something of the opposite of what's going on right now. Um, you also need free speech and media protections, because if you don't have those things, uh, the other protections kind of fall down as well. They're all connected. You need a place where it's legal and accepted and encouraged to use cryptography for everything you do. And you need a place that encourages the development of these tools. Because right now, cryptography mostly seem to work, but there are so many problems surrounding the use of cryptography that in practice it's really, really hard. And in practice, most countries put a lot of limits on what you can do with cryptography. In fact, it turns out I work for an American company. And because of US export restrictions, it might be that if I teach someone in Ecuador something that I learned while I was in the US, 
I might be breaking export restrictions in the US. And US takes really seriously um, their export restrictions. These things are really hard to navigate. So you need some place where legislation is pushing in the other direction, saying that, yes, we encourage you to use cryptography. No, even more, we require you to use cryptography. We need a place where people's data, the data about you, about me, all of these things that we give away on the internet, do we really, when we give our data to Facebook or wherever, if we give our emails to Yahoo, are we okay with Yahoo owning that data? Are we actually giving away the data? Um, it was a famous case um, last, I don't know, one or two years ago, where um, Instagram, Instagram is a famous, uh, quite popular um, picture sharing site where you take a picture and you upload it into the cloud and uh, it's shared with all of your friends. Now, Instagram decided to change their, their policies, um, the, the terms of agreement. And the new terms of agreement basically said that they had a right to use your pictures that you had taken and uploaded for uh, ads without telling you, without telling anyone that they were actually um, coming from real people. Now, they had the right to do this according to them because their terms of, terms of agreement that you agreed to when you installed the application say that they own the pictures. So when you take a picture with Instagram and you upload it, you are giving away ownership to another company. And this happens with all the data we deal with regularly. If, if you think that when you do a payment somewhere, your credit card number, um, it's a very legal murky area whether you are, uh, it, whether you are even the owner of the data of what your, uh, what your credit card number is anymore. There have been a string of password releases where lots of companies have made huge mistakes with how they say passwords and hackers have gotten in and they've stolen passwords. Now, you can ask yourself, legally, is your password your property? Uh, could you have any expectations on how a company stores your password? Well, right now, not really. But what we need is something like data custodianship, where you are giving your data to a company, but not as ownership. You're just letting them take care of the data for you and you can have requirements on how they store that data. Maybe I only want to use a site that really promises to store my credit card information securely, and there are sanctions if you don't do this. Now, there's another reason why we need all of this stuff. And the reason for that is because the current path we are on, the, the current path the world is on, leads to a world where there is no difference between corporations and governments. Countries and corporations become the same thing, and there is really no way of, of stopping a company that becomes big enough to, to be a part of one of these conglomerates. We're, we're seeing mega corporations that already can avoid paying taxes because they are so international, they're so global that they can just use the, the right place to avoid paying taxes. And the current path we're on is feeding this capitalist, well, I, I would say it's a capitalist nightmare. Uh, um, we really need something like an internet free state, a country that is a safe haven for the internet, where the internet as a person can s feel safe and cozy and, and secure. So what does that have to do with Ecuador? And as you probably guessed from my title, uh, I suspect that looking around the world right now, there are not many countries where doing something like this, going in this direction would even be possible. So why would Ecuador be one of those places, or maybe even the only place? So there are a lot of reasons. All of them add up. Ecuador is not a perfect country for any of these things. No country is a perfect country, and everything is complicated. I think the first thing that actually stood out for me that actually makes Ecuador a good country for this is because it's small. Uh, being small can be a detriment with many of these things, but actually, if you're small, it makes it easier to change. You can more, make more rapid changes. And in fact, we've seen the last eight, ten years of Ecuador's his history has seen extremely rapid changes, improvements in, in uh, levels of poverty, in uh, economy, in education, in all these things. And, and making these changes this quickly 
has only been possible because Ecuador is a small country. Now, the other thing that makes a big difference is that Ecuador is one of the few countries that, well, Ecuador has fewer trade agreements with other countries than most other countries. Now, there are really two different sides of this story. You have the internal legislation for a country, and then you have the trade agreements between other countries. And for most of the countries in the world, uh, for example, most countries have um, have signed the Vassenaer Agreement that restricts how cryptography can flow between different countries. Ecuador is one of the few countries that haven't signed this agreement, and this actually makes Ecuador uh, freer. There are more options that Ecuador can take without breaking any of the existing agreements. So, yeah, so no negative crypto laws internally in the country also makes a big difference. You have a fantastic constitution. That constitution uh, enshrines the right to privacy for individuals. And this is one of those things that, like, I don't know of any other country that actually think it's important enough to put that into the constitution. It's fantastic. Ecuador has tried a lot of innovative approaches the last 10 years as well. We, uh, the, the death situation has been more or less solved through a lot of very innovative finessing. And, and um, the same thing is true in the direction of intellectual, intellectual property and copyright. Ecuador is trying new things or being inspired by the best countries in the world when it comes to these freedoms. Um, you have good universities. And a history of fighting large corporations as well as uh, not necessarily bowing down to the... Uh, uh, the big imperialist countries in the world. Uh, finally, um, I, I think that the fact that Ecuador is small and has all these advantages, but is also embedded in the middle of Latin America gives it a huge strength. I like the idea of a mega-diverse country, and I would like to see that lead to a mega-diverse internet as well. So why would Ecuador do this? Why? why why shouldn't Ecuador just sign all the agreements, make friends with the U.S., uh, just Go with the flow and do what every other country in the world are doing. Well, there are a lot of reasons for it. I think one of the reasons where I think it's interesting, I happen to know that Ecuador is trying to transform into a knowledge society, trying to transform away from being dependent on raw material and going more and more in the direction of producing, uh, producing uh, knowledge. And something like this would be a fantastic way of kickstarting that. Because how do you differentiate yourself when everyone is trying to become a knowledge economy? It's an alternative model that would be very attractive to a new kind of business, for certain kind of businesses. Uh, it's an alternative model that requires of Ecuador to build up a lot of knowledge about a lot of complicated issues. But honestly, those, that knowledge will be fantastic, a fantastic asset for Ecuador to have once it's done. It will attract a lot of smart people that do not really like the direction the world is going. And um, it will be a way of finding new allies. A country needs to do this. Some country will have to do this. Um, and if it's Ecuador, Ecuador is going to be the one that leads the way. And that's going to create a lot of goodwill with a lot of countries that would like to do the same thing, but maybe haven't been able to yet. There needs to be a credible alternative to imperialist USA in the world right now. And I think um, at the end of the day, even without all of these reasons, and in my mind, this is the right thing to do. This is the moral high ground. This is the thing that could set you apart from every other country in the world and actually show that uh, there is a country in the world that has a moral spine. So from a technical standpoint, and I'm not going to get too technical, but there are a few areas that I think that um, you need to focus on when, when doing something like this. And um, so let's see. I think the first one, and, and you've heard this over and over again yesterday and today, open source free software, extremely important. I can't overstate it. Without free software, we have no way of doing any of this. You need to, you can't build privacy and security and anonymity on proprietary ground. That doesn't work. Um, of course, it also leads to a lot of other things. Um, it's the right thing to do, once again, but it leads to better quality of software. It leads to uh, more spread of knowledge. Now, the other thing you actually really need, and, and this is not talked about as much as uh, free software, is open hardware. 
Um, we're just in the beginning of the open hardware revolution, and uh, before this is all over, we need to be in a situation where we can trust not only the software, but the hardware. Right now, you have no idea what runs on your phone. I'm going to talk about phones later, by the way, but you have no idea what runs on your computer. You have no idea what runs in your, I don't know, car, dishwasher. We're going into an internet of things where both the hardware and the software is proprietary. That is deeply scary. There is another problem, and that's the cloud. The cloud is very attractive, and being a developer, um, I like the idea of the cloud because it makes it really, really, really easy to create something and push it, push it out there, and it just works. But the dirty secret, well, it's not really a secret, but the problem with cloud is that it's all based on American companies. All the big clouds are American companies. And even if your data is hosted outside of the US, it's still owned by an American company. If someone comes to Rackspace or Amazon, and that someone is the government, and they have a national security letter, and you happen to be a software developer in Ecuador or Uganda, you are not going to have any recourse, because your application runs on American soil, according to the USA. And this is a huge problem. It's a huge problem for two reasons. It's a problem because it puts all of your eggs in the, in the US basket, but also you centralize the data. Cloud is very good at centralizing data. Now, what's really needed is a cloud for the global south, and that's why I kind of like the idea of clouds and share, because it's for the global south. Um, the idea is really that a few countries in the global south need to come together and build the infrastructure necessary to host a cloud that is not hosted under repressive legislation. Mobile phones are broken. They are absolutely and completely broken. They're kaput. We should throw them away and give up and start from scratch. There are a lot of reasons for this, and I'm not going to go into deep technical reason, but, but the basic problem is the protocols used for phones make it very easy to track. It's very hard to be anonymous when your phone tells a cell phone tower every, every five minutes where you are. And there's also the problem that the phones themselves are littered with backdoors, both on the hardware side and on the, phys on, on the, infra on the software side. So whoever does this, in order to have a complete story, needs to do research around how to replace the current mess that is cell phones. We need a new model for mobile infrastructure. And maybe that model is just that we should have free Wi-Fi over the whole country. And you could just use that instead as a beginning. Of course, telecoms don't like these kind of changes. Telecoms are big companies, and they make a lot of money, and they are deeply, deeply part of the infrastructure of a country. So what you need to do in order to do something like this is to find a different business model for telecoms. Because they're not going to go away. They're too enmeshed to go away. And if you take away what they're doing right now, they're just going to fight against it. So in order to make this work, you need to find a new business model. In fact, a lot of what I'm talking about actually has to do with finding new business models. Finally, and this is, um, uh, this is one of the places where the constitution of Finland is actually a little bit more uh, interesting than the Ecuador constitution. But I, I think that this is something to aim for. Uh, keep in mind, by the way, I'm not talking about changes that should be done the next year. This is like something to aim for over 20 years. But Finland has in their constitution that everyone has a right to internet. And I actually really like that idea because at this point, the, the direction the world is going uh, having access to internet is crucial to, to live in the modern uh, digital age. Uh, so connectivity for everyone is something to aim for. The same thing is true with email. Everyone should be able to have access to email. And you need an email account to do a lot of things in modern society. And I know that a lot of people today go to Gmail or Yahoo or Hotmail. Once again, all of your email is stored in the United States, and you as Ecuadorians have no rights whatsoever. Even, it, it's interesting, in the US, even uh, Americans don't really have much rights to their email after, after three months. But uh, you have no rights when you, even when you send an email. So 
that's the technical perspective, and, and that's a whole bunch of stuff. I, I want to quickly talk about from the policy side, and I think that this is not going to come as a surprise based on my definition of what a privacy haven would look like. Right now, today, the absolutely most crucial thing for Ecuador is to not make any changes that take away the possibility of going in this direction. No negative changes. No trade agreements that are harsher or impose more limitations than the ones you have right now. Um, the next step is to actually start enforcing the privacy rights and, and make sure that no laws, no legislation can be passed that actually contravenes the privacy rights in the Constitution. Uh, fundamentally, from a policy side, there needs to be a right to anonymity. People should have the right to be anonymous. There should be nothing strange about being anonymous on the Internet. You need to have pro-crypto legislation, and that means a lot of different things. It means, it means that you should have the right to use the strongest possible encryption, but it also means that public websites should probably only use encryption, and it should be uh, frowned upon or, uh, I don't know, illegal to have a public website that is not going over uh, encrypted, uh, uh, encrypted uh, traffic completely. But in order to make this happen, you also need help. Uh, Cryptography is complicated and you need the, if the government is saying, yes, we believe in cryptography, you need actually uh, to make that work through the whole of the, um, uh, of the country. Uh, you need something around media and uh, mass media and, and, and newspapers and so on. I think that the right thing for Ecuador to do is just to take the Icelandic, well, the International Modern Media uh, Institutes, uh, IMI, which is a set of proposed legal changes that was taken from a lot of different countries, constitutions, and, and legislations. Uh, it's basically a package that gives you a lot of freedoms when it comes to media. IP and copyright. There shouldn't be any such thing as a software patent. Um, and when it comes to other kinds of intellectual property and copyright, um, most of the world is going in the direction of extending the lifetime of copyright and making it easier to enforce uh, so-called intellectual property. Um, Ecuador and India are the two places I know that is going in another direction, and I think this is fantastic. Um, so yeah, you need to stop making government agreements with proprietary companies. What that means is that you can't go and make bulk deals with Microsoft. That just doesn't work in a world like this, and, and it's not good for anyone. Um, use free software as much as possible in, in both the public sectors, but also in private companies. But more importantly, teach free software. And I, I know that Ecuador is really good at this compared to the rest of the world. Uh, I do think that there could be more improvements when it comes to this. Now, the final part is really that there are a few dangers. And as I said, it, it, there are a few things that it, if Ecuador passes a specific law, everything can be completely lost. The current one that is most problematic is the new uh, penal code. And the penal code in itself is a really big chunk of stuff. It contains many, many different things. But there are two paragraphs or three paragraphs in it that say basically that all internet traffic has to be, uh, has to be saved away. Every internet cafe has to uh, store videos and identifications of everyone that uses their computers, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, this piece looks like Ecuador went from nowhere to taking all the most repressive, uh, uh, repressive IP logging laws they could find around the world. Luckily, this law has not passed yet. Uh, it's in the final stages, but this is a typical example of this par these paragraphs. They need to be stopped. They're dangerous. For everyone, they're not. I mean, even if you don't want to go in the direction of a privacy haven, these laws and these kind of provisions are extremely dangerous for everyone living in a country with them. Uh, they're basically a shortcut towards uh, a police state. There is a lot of temptation uh, from law enforcement to do these things, but uh, there are also a lot of good reasons for law enforcement, if they actually think about it, to not want these kind of laws. And it's everyone's everyone's responsibility, everyone who knows about these things, to educate and, and try to stop this kind of legislation from going through. There are a lot of potential trade agreements floating around right now, and as I mentioned before, 
if you go with something like TPP or, or all the similar ones, suddenly you have your hands tied behind your back. You have two choices. Either you comply or you break the trade agreement and, and face the sanctions. So the best thing to do is to not do trade agreements of this kind. Instead, try to do trade agreements with, uh, with the Andean community, like the ones you already have, and, and try to cooperate with countries that are more willing to actually go in the right direction. Many of these things look good when they first come, and I, I'm reminded I was in Sweden when uh, the law, uh, F FRA law, um, was passed that I talked about earlier. That makes all of this surveillance and wiretapping legal that I talked about. Now, all the arguments that were given at that time was that, yeah, we have lots of oversight. There's no problem here. It's just a very limited thing. And anyway, they already do it. So what's the harm in passing this law? Well, that was in 2009. Four years later, we have gone pretty far down the slippery slope where, in fact, it turns out that now they're doing much more because they have the right to do it. This law is used uh, and it's being tweaked. Once the basic law is there, small changes are introduced and no one even notices. And suddenly you're in a very repressive society and you didn't really even notice when the legislation became that repressive. So these kind of things, they need to be stopped as quickly as possible and before they become, they snowball into, into big things. Most of the time, there is no malicious intent behind these kind of legislation, or I hope there is no malicious intent. But especially when it comes to the trade agreements, there is a capitalist pressure to enforce copyright, for example, that makes all of these companies, uh, the, the, the movie association and, the, and, and so on, they push for the hardest things they can push for, and they have no interest in safeguarding the, the rights of the people on the other side. I hope that by going down this direction, and this is really what I would like for, for Ecuador, is to lead the way. I want Ecuador to be the inspiration that the rest of the world actually needs. I would like that once, uh, and I would hope, once this starts, the other Andean community members will start following, the other Latin American countries will start following, and soon this will, this will be another snowball that can't be stopped going in the other direction. Because doing this, it looks really hard. Doing it from scratch and just continuing on your own is impossible. You need allies. But someone needs to start this. And, and I think that Ecuador is the best positioned country probably in the whole world uh, for leading the way for the 21st century. A 21st century that actually thinks about these issues. That is um, safeguarding our rights and builds, an, uh, builds a place where people actually